We're on Jeremiah chapter 11. The first three verses. The word which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, saying, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say to them, Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not heed the words of this covenant. Well, the words here are striking. It says, cursed is the man. It doesn't say the Jew or anything like that, or Israelite even. <clears throat> cursed is he who does not heed the words of this covenant. Now, this is a remembrance of what was said in Torah, which is in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this Torah by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. Now, uh, um, the interesting thing here, it says, hear the words of the covenant. Okay, I heard them. Did you hear them? Okay, well, good. That's good, isn't it? What does that mean, hear? To do it? I thought it just meant you had to hear the words. No? You got to pay attention and, and do it? Do you think believe has that same connotation? It does. <laughs> it has the exact same connotation. You got to do it. You got to do to believe in Messiah. Oh, yep, I believe in him. If you were running for office, I'd pull that, I'd, I'd punch that card where, by his name. Wouldn't you? That's not what it means, though. It means to heed. Uh, to heed what he says. Look at verses 4 and 5, which which I commanded your forefathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice, and do according to all which I command you, so you shall be my people, and I'll be your Elohim. In order to confirm the oath which I swore to your forefathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day, then I answered and said, Amen, O Yahweh. Now, verse 4 here, that's a... Uh, really a quote from Leviticus 26, verses 3 and 12. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, I will also walk among you and be your Elohim, and you shall be my people. Now, Elohim makes it very clear. He demands obedience from Israel. Why would others think they can have a relationship with him without the same requirements? What, did he change his requirements? <clears throat> you can't have a relationship with him without obedience. Um, it, it's similar on a much smaller scale to your earthly father when you're growing up as a kid. You can't have a relationship with your father if you're not obedient to him. <clears throat> Verses 6 and 7. And Yahweh said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers in the day that I brought them up from the land of Egypt, even to this day, warning, persistently saying, listen to my voice. He always says, listen to my voice. Now, when a parent says that to their child, what's that mean? Listen to me. What's that mean? Obey. That means obey. I mean, that's what it means. Obey my voice, is that what it says in the scriptures? Yeah. Yeah. That means you have to do what they say. When they say, listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> in uh, Deuteronomy 4, the first two verses, we, we read, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I'm teaching you to perform in order that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I'm commanding you today, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your Elohim, which I command you. Uh, in Deuteronomy 13, verse 4, You shall follow Yahweh, your Elohim, and fear him. You shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. You see, those last four phrases, they're saying the same thing. Keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, cling to him. That's how you, that's how you serve him. That's how you cling to him. 
is by, is by listening to his voice, which means keep his commandments. <clears throat> In Matthew 17, verse 5, this is the transfiguration. And while he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, the listen to him part, that's recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is because the people are responsible for what he says to them. In Deuteronomy 18, we read about this prophet like Moses, and that is who Messiah is, the prophet like Moses. We read in Deuteronomy 18, verses 18 and 19, I'll raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. That's why he said you've got to listen to his words, which he's going to speak in my name, and I will require it of those. That's why he said at that transfiguration, listen to him. He's telling them, this is the prophet like Moses. Jeremiah 11, verse 8. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked each one in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought on them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. You know, the people were walking according to what their heart told them. They're walking according to how they felt about it. Um, I hear the same thing today. You know, <clears throat> did you ever hear, how many times have you heard this? Um, the Holy Spirit has not led me to keep the Sabbath. The, the Holy Spirit hasn't put it on my heart to keep the Sabbath. What's that mean? Not well, they're not listening for one thing, yeah, yeah. And what are they following? Their heart. Yeah, he sure does. He said it's deceitful above all things. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's sad. Verses 9 and 10. Then Yahweh said to me, A conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They've turned back to the iniquities of their ancestors who refused to hear my words, and they've gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. The people have essentially formed a conspiracy not to follow the Torah. They refuse to listen to his instructions. They're just not going to do it. Yeah, what well, was so difficult about it, right? Why would they reject it? Right now it's the same, same, same thing now. Why the rejection? What's so, what's so difficult about it? What's so objectionable? Yeah, I don't get that. Um, love your neighbor and how to do that, how to care for one another. Is that so objectionable? Uh, yeah, people want to do their own thing. But they want to do how they feel. We're, we're an emotionally led people, you know. Emotion's everything. Emotions, everything. I mean, um, that, that dictates everything. They're just in little things, too. Uh, who'd you vote for? Well, so-and-so. Well, why don't you vote for the other guy? I don't like him. Why not? Well, I just don't. I just don't like him. So that dictates. So correct ways or righteousness don't matter. It matters what you like. Okay? That's what's important. That's, uh, that's sad. <coughs> Verse 11. Therefore thus says Yahweh, Behold, I'm bringing disaster on them which they will not be able to escape. Though they will cry to me, yet I will not listen to them. <clears throat> okay, here's the deal. If we don't listen to him, he won't listen to us. Okay? It works that way. It works that way. <clears throat> well, that's right. He, he, and he gives us ears to hear. But if we, if we tune out what he says, um, 
why should he listen to us? You know, I, I think it's tantamount to the parent with the two-year-old. The two-year-olds, they have a lot to say, don't they? So should the parent be listening to the two-year-old, or should the two-year-old be listening to the parent? Uh, it's just, I know some parents, but we won't go there. Proverbs 28, 9. He who turns away his ear from listening to the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. If he doesn't listen to the Torah, specifically says Torah, these prayers that they do on Sunday morning are worthless. Two billion people with their little prayers that aren't being heard. <clears throat> their prayers are an abomination. Proverbs 1, starting at verse 20. Wisdom shouts in the streets. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. Okay, what is wisdom here in Proverbs? That is the following of the Torah. That's wisdom. Being obedient to the Torah. It's personified here in this passage. <clears throat> How long, O oh naive ones, will you love simplicity? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Turn to my reproof. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit on you. I'll make my words known to you. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will even laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes on like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come on you, then they'll call on me, but I will not answer. They'll seek me diligently, but they shall not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh. Ezekiel 8, starting at verse 13, he said to me, Yet you will see greater abominations which they are committing. <clears throat> then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was toward the north. <coughs> Excuse me. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Yet you will still see greater abominations than these. Then he brought me into an in, uh, to the inner court of Yahweh's house. And behold, at the entrance to the temple of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar, there were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of Yahweh and their faces toward the east. And they were prostrating themselves eastward toward the sun. And he said to me, do you see this, son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they've committed here? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, that they have filled the land with violence and provoked me repeatedly. For behold, they're putting the twig to the nose. Therefore, I indeed shall deal in wrath. My eye will have no pity, nor shall I spare. Even though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, Yet I shall not listen to them. <clears throat> Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, Yahweh's hand is not so short that it cannot save. Neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your Elohim. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Deuteronomy 31, verses 17 and 18. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day. And I'll forsake them and hide my face from them, and they'll be consumed, and many evils and troubles shall come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Is it not because our Elohim is not among us that these evils have come upon us? But I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they will do, for they will turn to other gods. So we looked at one, two, three, four, five, six passages in different books of Scripture that all say the same thing. You don't listen to him, he's not going to listen to us. Very simple. Um, it's, it's amazing how people are so convinced they don't have to listen to him. They don't have to obey him. And I would, I would say this, that if you knew someone that, was, that could read well and understand and never had any teaching whatsoever on the scripture, not, no teaching whatsoever, and you gave them a Bible, scriptures, and say, okay, this is the word of the creator of the universe to us. 
Read it and tell me what you come up with. There is no one that ever would have come up with Christianity. No one ever would have. Christianity, by reading the Bible alone. It would not happen. <clears throat> um, I've, I've heard accounts of uh, missionaries going to places, Africa, India, and they're helping teach more about the scriptures. And uh, the people there would say, well, we've been reading the Bible. We don't eat the unclean things. We honor the Sabbath day. And uh, the missionary that I heard said, okay, that's what I'll do while we're here. He didn't, he didn't know how to tell them what not to pay attention to or what, what's okay to not do and what they need to do. He said, instead of mincing that kind of thing up, I just said, yeah, that's what it says. That's what, uh, and I think that's a good example. But there's no way people would come up with Easter? Uh, rabbits and eggs? Really? On uh, Christmas trees? Lights on your house? Exchanging gifts? Happy birthday, Jesus, and December 25th? Uh, Sunday morning worship? Would they ever come up with all those things? No. No. It's listening to the traditions of man instead of the scriptures, the word from the Father. Verses 12 and 13. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they burn incense, but they surely will not save them in the time of their disaster. For your gods are as many as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars. You have set up a shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. Well, they're going to cry to their false gods, to Baal and others, and nothing's going to happen. Verses 14 and 15. Therefore do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done so many vile deeds? Can the sacrificial flesh take away from you your disaster so that you can rejoice? You see, Jeremiah, he's told, don't even pray for him. Because Elohim's not going to listen. The sacrifices they do will not keep disaster from coming upon them. Um, Elohim uses endearing terms to describe his people. He calls them my beloved. <clears throat> uh, but they've been doing many, many vile deeds. Their sacrifices won't take away this disaster that's going to come upon them. Why were they still doing the offerings? Why were they still doing the sacrifices? Remember the term, well, I guess it's the least I could do. That's what it was. It was the least they could do. Let's go to the offerings. I hear it's going to be a good barbecue. That's what would happen. Verses 16 and 17. Yahweh called your name a green olive tree, beautiful in fruit and form. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it, and its branches are worthless. And the Yahweh of hosts who planted you has pronounced evil against you because of the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done to provoke me by offering up sacrifices to Baal. Israel here, they're called a green olive tree. Now, that's important. Because this is, this is how we uh, decipher symbolism in Scripture. An olive tree, that's how they're referred to, Israel's referred to, in Romans 11. Paul uses that analogy. <clears throat> and he talks about uh, Gentiles being grafted into the rich olive tree of Israel. And some of the existing branches being broken off. Verse 18, moreover, Yahweh made it known to me, and I knew it. When you did show me their deeds, but I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know that they devised plots against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. <clears throat> Many in Israel have uh, plotted to kill Jeremiah. They didn't like his message, and they want to shut him up. 
Elohim revealed this to Jeremiah. Uh, why didn't they just? Why didn't they just make him prove it or try to get him to explain better? Instead of why? Why kill him? Why want to kill him? Why shut him up? You know, Tom, that's very good. I think so, too. They knew they were wrong. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to point it out. <coughs> Verse 20. But, O Yahweh of hosts, who judges righteously, who tries the feelings in the heart, let me see thy, thy, your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Therefore, thus says Yahweh concerning the men of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, do not prophesy in the name of Yahweh that you might not die at our hand. Anathoth has threatened Jeremiah, saying that if he doesn't stop prophesying in the name of Yahweh, they're going to murder him. Verse 22, Therefore thus says the Yahweh of hosts, Behold, I'm about to punish them. The young men will die by the sword, their sons and daughters will die by famine. And a remnant will not be left to them, for I will bring disaster on the men of Anathoth, the year of their punishment. So Yahweh is going to destroy all the enemies of Jeremiah. All of Judah is going to be either destroyed or taken captive. And the fact of the matter is, what hope do people have that are disobedient to Elohim? And they have no hope. Sometimes it takes a while for that to manifest itself. But that's the fact of the matter. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1, Righteous are you, O Yahweh, that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? So Jeremiah acknowledges the righteousness of Yahweh, but he wants to discuss the question, Why do the wicked prosper? You know, the same question is asked by Job, if you'll recall. In Job 21, verse 7, why do the wicked still live, continue on, also become very powerful? You know, um, David answers this dilemma in Psalm 37. And we're going to look at um, a large passage here in Psalm 37, starting at the beginning. <clears throat> verse 1 do not fret because of evildoers. Do not, uh, be not envious toward wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in Yahweh and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in Yahweh and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to Yahweh. Trust in him and he will do it. And he'll bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in Yahweh and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for Yahweh, they will inherit the land. What does that mean, they will inherit the land? What's another way to say that? No. Inherit the land. What does that mean? What, use a common Christian term. Yeah, go to heaven. Really? That's what it means. That's what the term actually means. The people don't know that when they say go to heaven. They don't know that that means that land in Israel. Okay? Right now, that land is. <clears throat> no, those who wait on Yahweh, they'll inherit the land. <clears throat> Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you'll look carefully for his place, and he'll not be there. But the humble will, will inherit the land, and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The wicked plots against the righteous, and gnashes at him with his teeth. Adonai laughs at him, for he sees his day coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow, to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. <clears throat> their sword will enter their own heart and their bows will be broken. Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. 
For the arms of the wicked will be broken, and Yahweh sustains the righteous. Yahweh knows the days of the blameless, and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil, and in the days of famine they will have abundance. But the wicked will perish, and the enemies of Yahweh will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke, they vanish away. <clears throat> the wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those blessed by him will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be cut off. The steps of a man are established by Yahweh, and he delights in his way. Um, so David answers that dilemma. Why do the wicked prosper? <clears throat> he says, uh, give it time. Let Elohim work things in his time. Okay? The righteous will be rewarded. The wicked will be cut off from the land. What's another way of saying cut off from the land if you're a Christian and you don't know what you're saying? Going to hell. Going to hell that's right. <laughs> yeah. Not allowed to enter. That's right. But didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Yeah. <clears throat> Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. <coughs> Verse 2 of Jeremiah 12. You've planted them, they have also taken root. They grow, they've even produced fruit. You are near to their lips, but far from their mind. Uh, the wicked give lip service to Elohim. Their actions show that their mind is not on him at all. Jeremiah is perplexed. <clears throat> because he knows here, he says, uh, you've planted them, and they've taken root. Well, this is another predestination passage. He's the one that's done it. Verse 3, but you know me, O Yahweh. You see me, <clears throat> and you do examine my heart's attitude toward you. Drag them off like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for a day of carnage. Jeremiah wants justice for the wicked. Verse 4, how long is the land to mourn and the vegetation of the countryside to wither? For the wickedness of those who dwell in it, animals and birds have been snatched away because men have said he will not see our latter ending. <clears throat> uh, the wickedness of the people, that's caused the land to wither and the creatures in the land to disappear. Elohim is now going to answer Jeremiah. Verse 5, if you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of Jordan? For even your brothers in the household of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Even they have cried aloud for you. Do not believe them, although they may say nice things to you. Uh, Elohim tells Jeremiah that the problems haven't even started yet. If he thinks they're bad now, just wait and see when real judgment starts. Verse 7, for I have forsaken my house, I have abandoned my inheritance. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My inheritance has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has roared against me, therefore I have come to hate her. Elohim has abandoned his inheritance. And his inheritance, what he's talking to is, that, is the land. He's forsaken his house. He's speaking of his temple. He calls Israel the beloved of his soul. And he's going to give them into the hand of their enemies. Verses 9 and 10. Is my inheritance like a speckled bird of prey to me? Are the birds of prey against her on every side? Go, gather all the beasts of the field, bring them to devour. Many shepherds have ruined my vineyard, they've trampled down my field, they've made my pleasant field a desolate wilderness. The land, his land is not prospering due to the sin of Israel. The shepherds of Israel have allowed the wild beasts to trample the land. This is, uh, I don't think that's a literal curse, I think uh, it's a reference to allowing disobedience to the Torah in the land of his inheritance. Verse 11, it has been made a desolation, desolate it mourns before me. The whole land has been made desolate because no man lays it to heart. 
On all the bare heights in the wilderness, destroyers have come. For a sword of Yahweh is devouring from one end of the land even to the other. There is no peace for anyone. They have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. They have strained themselves to no profit. But be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of Yahweh. Utter devastation is going to uh, come to pass because of their lawlessness and their utter disobedience. Verse 14, thus says Yahweh concerning all my wicked neighbors who strike at the inheritance with which I have endowed my people Israel. Behold, I'm about to uproot them from their land and will uproot the house of Judah from among them. Now that's what Babylon's going to do. They're going to uproot Judah from their land and Elohim will use them to take them from that promised land like he says he will. Verse 15, it'll come about that after I have uprooted them, I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them back, each one to his inheritance and each one to his land. Then it will come about that if they really learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, as Yahweh lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they will be burnt up, or built up, excuse me, in the midst of my people. Elohim will have compassion on them. He says he's going to bring them back into the land. <clears throat> and if they obey his Torah, they're going to prosper again. And lastly, verse 17, but if they will not listen, then I'll, up, I'll uproot that nation, uproot and destroy it, declares Yahweh. See, Elohim demands obedience. It's not optional. It's the number one important thing, okay? Um, if you say you believe in Messiah, that should mean that you take the word made flesh is the word of the Father, and that you take it seriously and you, and you, abide, you uh, abide by it. That should be what believe means, okay? But we've turned it into a feeling. We've turned it into an emotion. You know, your, your belief. Um, a week ago, I believed the Razorbacks were a decent basketball team. I believed wrong. They're horrible. <laughs> but yeah, they, we couldn't even beat Missouri, which hadn't won a game. We made them so happy, though. You know, we should feel better because we made the Missouri fans so happy. But that's what I believed. And my belief was uh, sincerely wrong. He demands obedience. It's not optional. We read in 1 Peter 2, starting at verse 6. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. See, that's just believe, right? Believe. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. There's that believe again. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. Well, I thought they just disbelieved. That's what disbelief is. That's being disobedient to the word. And to this doom, they were also appointed. Wow. That's what they were appointed for. Their appointment that they were going to go to is destruction. To this doom, they were also appointed. <clears throat> Um, like I was saying, if uh, someone who didn't know anything that was not brainwashed at all by any other kind of religion started reading the Bible and said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go by what this book says, they would say, well, God doesn't change. Okay? Um, his, his word doesn't change. It's always consistent because that's what he keeps saying in here. Uh, we're supposed to walk like Messiah, and Messiah was obedient to the Torah. Uh, if I'm his, I'm a part of the nation of Israel. Okay? Um, since he never changes and his word never changes, and we're supposed to be like Messiah who obeyed the Torah, which was given to his people and actually was there from the very beginning, then by reading this book, I should be obedient to the laws that he gives me here. Now, I don't think there's any way to read that book just by reading the book without any preconceptions 
and come up with anything different. Okay. But instead, people come up with, <clears throat> well, you know, the law has been done away with. There, that's the old law. We have the new law, which is love Jesus. Uh, when I die, I'm going to heaven, and the rest of y'all are going to hell, because uh, you don't love Jesus as much as I do. And I go to church on Sunday, and I love Christmas and Easter. There. Now, any of those things, could you read that book and come up with any of those things? No, you cannot. But aren't those things the backbone of Christianity? Yes, they are. Hmm? Everything. Everything, yeah. Uh -huh. So, any questions, any thoughts on Jeremiah 11 and 12? Jeremiah is not a happy book. Okay. There's some happy stuff here and there in there sprinkled. But all in all, y'all been disobedient. Y'all are going to suffer. It's going to be so bad that it, it brings this Jeremiah guy to tears over and over again. Okay, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we do pray that we do take your, your word and your message to our hearts. And uh, that can only happen with you writing these things on our hearts and minds. We pray that um, through our lives, Father, that you be glorified. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen.